Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Meet one of the most remarkable men in industry, George W. Borg. Back in 1910, he helped the auto industry on its feet by developing the first workable automobile clutch. Since then, he has come up with many other ideas and inventions and enjoyed a long career as a highly successful businessman. During World War II, at an age when most men would be looking forward to retirement, he branched out into an entirely new line, developing machines that can produce synthetic fur, which he foresaw as being used primarily in polishers and buffers. Little did George W. Borg realize how much broader a field his synthetic fur was to conquer. Today, in this big new Borg Corporation plant at Delavan, Wisconsin, the knitting and processing machines can barely keep up with demand for the new fabric, which starts out as loosely woven ropes of synthetic fibers like Daycron, Nylon, or Orlon. These ropes will make up the pile. Fed into knitting machines, they are stitched closely to a backing and the fabric emerges in tubular form. Each tube must be slit open before further processing occurs. The fabric is soft as the finest lambskin, which in fact it closely resembles. Until it's slit, the backing side is out, the furry side within. Mr. Borg is the old-fashioned type of businessman who retains responsibility for all phases of the company's operations. Here he visits the inspection department. Now, after being backed with a coating that prevents the material from stretching, as knitted goods ordinarily do, the fabric is sheared, the pile cut to the proper uniform height. Incidentally, the town of Delavan had lost its only major industry and gave every indication of becoming a ghost town before Borg came along and started this dynamic company, which has become the community's economic mainstay. The fabric, intended originally to be used almost entirely in buffers, found a much bigger market with the development of the paint roller. Because it is impervious to water and chemicals, the synthetic fur did not mat as sheepskin did when used with rubber-based paints. Light and warm, the fabric next was introduced as lining for winter garments, and here the surface has barely been scratched. Teddy bears and toy pandas, another big potential market. But biggest of all, perhaps, will be the fashion field, where designers are coming up daily with new ways of applying this exciting new material. No doubt about it, Mr. Borg, the man with the sure touch, has done it again. The essence of capital formation is saving putting aside a part of production so that we will have the capital equipment to provide more jobs and goods to live better. Capital formation is necessary in every kind of society in order to provide for future jobs and goods. It has reached its greatest heights in the United States under our system of free choice, opportunity, and incentives. To maintain the high level of capital formation, which is the key to progress, national policy must permit saving and encourage investment. Steel mill scale. The particles of rust removed from steel after it has been hot rolled arrive by the carload here at the Plastic Metals Division of National U.S. Radiator Corporation in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. The tiny bits of rusty steel considered virtually a waste product until recent years, now plays an important role in a remarkable new method of metal fabrication. The job performed here at Plastic Metals is to convert the scale into iron powder for use in that new process. All sorts of materials handling equipment are employed in shuttling the metal from freight cars to the various furnaces, grinders, and grading screens through which it must pass. 
As the scale moves along, it is freed by magnetism of tramp iron and other foreign material. Then, mixed with powdered coke, it goes into a rotary kill where a temperature of 2100 degrees causes the coke to remove the oxygen from the iron. In other words, converting it from rusty iron back to pure iron. As the carbon in the coke combines with the oxygen, gases are formed, carbon monoxide, then carbon dioxide, which passes off harmlessly through the stack. Carbon dioxide is the gas used in some fire extinguishers and in solid form is dry ice. After several hours, the pure iron particles are removed through cooling coils and are separated from the coke magnetically. They then pass on to grinders and screens to be prepared as powder of the required fineness. Now the powdered iron will be mixed to ensure uniform quality, after which it will be ready for shipment to plants engaged in what is known as powder metallurgy. On a visit to one such plant in California, we see the iron powder mixed with a dry lubricant being compressed into any one of several thousand intricate shapes. The resulting compact, as it's called, is sintered or fused at 2,000 degrees. No further machining is required as a rule, and because of that, plus the speed of the operation, the elimination of waste and other factors, this type of metal fabrication is very economical. Not bad for a material that used to be thrown away. Industry on Parade visits century-old Elmira College at Elmira, New York for a brief look at one way in which the nation's educational and industrial organizations are joining forces in order better to serve the communities in which they operate. Broad general education is a prime goal of a school like this. So is specialized scientific education, particularly in this technological era. And so too is adult education in the estimate of the Elmira faculty members of which are meeting here with local industrial executives to work out this year's program for the college's Division of Community Education. Their aim is to help people of the area meet the specific challenges encountered on the job, thus increasing their productivity, their incomes, and the economic health of the community at large. Here's a class on statistics. Laboratory technicians and office workers learn how to analyze the flood of facts and figures that pass through their hands so as to let those facts and figures create a picture that makes sense. The students tend to be mostly young people on the way up, but classes usually include at least a few older workers, including some top executives. In addition to financing the program, industrial firms also provide some of the instructors and permit the use of plant facilities. Many of the students are helping themselves to make up for the lack of a college education. Foundry technology, time and motion study, business organization and management. The program is as diversified as local industry itself. With current industrial demand for greater skills in all departments, Elmira's successful program is one that many another college might emulate. In effect, the college has extended itself into every corner of the community, adapting its curriculum to cover the very real needs of its neighbors. Insofar as the Division of Community Education is concerned, the factory has become a classroom, and conventional classrooms part of the factory. These days, every hour of extra education for any of our citizens is a good thing for all of us. And this looks like an outstanding way to provide a good many hours of such supplementary education. Management is profoundly concerned with the desire of employees for regular work, not only because it is good business and good management to regularize production, but because steady operations benefit everybody, employees, stockholders, and the community as well. While the task of providing steadier work and pay involves complex problems, many employers have reduced and in some cases eliminated short-term layoffs. Taking the long view, it is evident that over the years, management has made giant strides in providing employees with uninterrupted work and income. In a 
a Minneapolis living room, former mailman and factory worker Herb Shopper walks in on a niece and nephew engaged in the old game of flea. He remembers the game from his own childhood, remembers that tosses of the dice determine how quickly the flea takes on body, head, legs, and so on, which each player then draws on a piece of paper as best he can. The game sets Herb to thinking. How would it be to mold the flea in all its parts out of plastic, eliminating the need for pencil, paper, and skillet drawing? With members of his family, he fashions a few trial models at home. Placed on sale at a local department store, these first games bring such an enthusiastic response that the shoppers soon find themselves working night and day, trying to keep up with the orders. That does it. Herb decides to go into the game business. The W.H. Shopper Manufacturing Company is born, and in its first three months turns out 40,000 sets of the game, now rechristened Cootie. What's more, Christmas comes and goes, but without any resultant slackening in demand. Largely by adding to its line other three-dimensional games based on old, familiar pencil and paper games like tic-tac-toe and dots and squares. The new company has zoomed in just a few years to a position among the top three or four game makers in the nation. At first they subcontracted their plastics molding work, then bought their own machines. Now they've branched out into still other games, brand new ones not based on pencil and paper originals. But Cootie continues to be the perennial bestseller with more than a million sets passing over department and toy store counters each year. The business of manufacturing toys and games is a tricky one. Today's most popular item can be a drug on the market tomorrow. Fortunately, that hasn't happened with this game, although the company has stubbed its toe on a couple of others. As with any other product designed for young people, there's a tremendous market in this country as a result of our level of prosperity and the high birth rate in recent years but you've got to come up with a product that pleases as this one continues to do. Introduction of a flop game can cost the manufacturer anywhere from $25,000 on up. To minimize the risk of coming out with a new game that will fall flat on its face, Herb Shopper consults his potential customers. A junior board of directors made up of Minneapolis youngsters considers every proposed addition to the company line. If they say yes, Herb can still exercise a veto. But if they say no, no it is, and that's final. <laughs> 